Emma Mijas died a horrible and painful death unnecessarily on her very first Christmas Eve 2004 at the hands of 25 doctors and nurses, another victim of medical malpractice. All 25 doctors and nurses systematically administered the wrong drugs for her life-threatening condition called SLOS. SLOS, Smith Limley Optus Syndrome, is a congenital abnormality which requires treatment strategies on supplying supplemental cholesterol. They gave Emma the wrong drug, Questran, not once, but 92 times, yes, 92 times in one month, a cholesterol reducing drug, not the cholesterol supplemental drug she needed. All of them knew better, they were trained to know better. They were some of the world's leading authorities at the Louisiana State University Health Science Center in New Orleans. But they just didn't give a damn about Emma's life. In 2013, the prestigious Journal of Patient Safety published a study that as many as 440,000 patients die each year from preventable medical errors. That would make medical errors the third leading cause of death in America, behind heart disease and cancer, which is second. These people are not dying from the illnesses that caused them to seek hospital care in the first place. No, they are dying from mistakes that hospitals could have prevented. What are these fatal errors? Who are these incompetent and negligent doctors? A New England Journal of Medicine January 28, 2016 study reported that 1% of physicians accounted for 32% of paid malpractice claims over the last 10 years. The ugly truth is that little is being done to hold these dangerous doctors accountable. Researchers found that bad doctors showed distinctive characteristics, including having paid previous malpractice claims. So it stands to reason that healthcare providers could eliminate one third of medical malpractice along with patients' pain and suffering, as well as the added cost of corrective surgeries, long-term care and indemnity payments by removing the worst 1% of doctors. Why aren't bad doctors stopped from practicing? The answer lies at least partially in the National Practitioner Data Bank, a clearinghouse for information on medical malpractice that Congress established in 1986 to help state licensing boards police the healthcare industry. The national database was supposed to help states identify dangerous doctors and prevent them from harming more patients, and is used by hospitals, insurers, and licensing boards to track doctors' records check prospective hires and make other decisions. But it is virtually useless in holding doctors accountable because by federal law, none are listed by name. They are assigned a random number to protect their identities. Even if doctors were identified in the data as they should be, the public would still be barred by law from accessing the records. So vulnerable sick patients sit in the waiting rooms of bad physicians without a clue about their poor record of performance. And in many cases, a negligent doctor's insurance company pays the victim of malpractice and the doctor goes back to work. If a doctor develops a bad enough reputation in one town, he can move to a new state and continue practicing. This is unbelievable. But today, the public does not have access to the database to identify doctors' names and addresses to identify doctors with uniquely long histories of being sued or disciplined for medical malpractice. Because on September 1st, 2011, the government cut off public access. What was behind that decision? Apparently, one Kansas doctor with a trail of malpractice suits, Dr. Robert Tenney. The Kansas-based doctor complained to the Government Health Resources and Service Administration that the Kansas City Star newspaper was publishing the story of one of his patients, Mary Beth Chase, who died in 2007 after undergoing a brain surgery with Dr. Tenney. It is also noted that Tenney had been sued at least 16 times for medical malpractice, but had never been disciplined by the state's 
licensing boards. The Insider Exclusive produced a TV story on this case with the lawyers who represented Mary Beth's family when doctors go bad, Mary Beth Chase versus Dr. Robert T. Tenney. Tenney finally settled the Chase family's wrongful death suit for $1 million. The settlement brought total malpractice payments paid on Tenney's behalf since the early 1990s to roughly $3.7 million. In some states, including California, Colorado, Georgia, and New York, patients can go to medical board's websites to find out about doctors' malpractice histories, but not in Kansas and Missouri. Why don't doctors report on bad doctors? Physicians often see the mistakes made by their peers, which puts them in a sticky ethical situation. Should they tell the patient about a mistake made by a different doctor? Too often, they don't. Why not? One reason is that doctors depend on each other for business. So a physician who breaks the code of silence may become known as an informer or snitch and lose referrals, a financial penalty. Doctors also may be wary of becoming entangled in a medical malpractice case or causing a colleague to face legal consequences. The bottom line, too often doctors aren't learning from errors, nor are patients getting the information they need to receive proper treatment or compensation when the outcome is harmful. In this insider exclusive network TV special, America's Medical Malpractice Crisis, What You Need to Know, we visit with Victor Ferrugia at the Ferrugia Law Firm as we take you inside today's legal system examining lawyers' strategies and clients' thoughts and in vivid detail showing you the often heartbreaking stories of these clients, dramatically demonstrating what motivates Victor to fight for his clients' causes. These victims could be you or me one day, and if you are so unlucky, you will quickly find out that justice in America is a hard-won battle where very few insurance companies, doctors, nurses, and hospitals ever do the right thing. And you need experienced and passionate trial lawyers who wage a battle with their own financial resources to get their clients justice. Here's just a few of the stories of many victims of medical malpractice that the Insider Exclusive Network TV shows have featured on Network TV. When the doctors gave me the choice and the options on the table, um, uh, either to save her life or to let her pass and uh, peacefully without no pain. Um, it was a small chance that she might live after surgery, but I, I, I chose life because I think that anybody deserves a fighting chance. So I, de I decided, my wife and I decided to go ahead with the surgery and give her the chance to fight herself. My daughter uh, Malia is special because um, she has a positive outlook on, on, on life in general, on how well she can accomplish things, um, how she's not different in any other way from anybody else besides the fact that her, her legs are, are metal. When I, when I realized that um, this could have been possibly avoided by doctors seeing my daughter sooner, of course I was very angry. Um, but I was also focusing on my daughter's condition at the present time. But it also made me think about a lot about myself if I would have, you know, demanded her to get attention sooner. I mean, there shouldn't be these things where we have to look back on it now and, and say, I wish I could have done this different. I wish I would have done this. Well, my daughter doesn't get that choice anymore. She has to live with this for the rest of her life. So hopefully this would be a learning experience for the doctors. That's why I would forgive them and tell them that, I mean, just get, just get better at what you do or pay more attention. She was a, a tremendous life, unbelievable energy. She threw parties and she had people over and, you know, she always made dinners for anybody who was sick and she got involved in every campfire girl, boy scout. She was very capable, smart, giving, dedicated to her children, dedicated to me. And I kept saying, Mom, what's wrong? What hurts? And she says, my abdomen. 
and she kept and she was miserable and we said well please call a doctor she needs to be examined we asked him three times the nurse said they'd call the doctors the doctors were aware of the problem but the unfortunate part about it is the doctors never showed up <laughs> and um, that's when I reached down and hugged her and I said we're here and she opened her eyes. When the doctors told me that I had to make a decision for my husband's amputations to survive or just let him go, that was very difficult for me. I had to think about it and pray about it and talk with my family. It was, it was a hard decision and um, life-changing. My wife has been an angel. Uh, she's stuck by me. She's done everything for me. My mom, my sisters, my brothers, my kids. Uh, without them, I wouldn't have made it. Dr. William J. Irwin failed to comply with the appropriate standard of care for an OBGYN in the year 2007. And as a result, Rebecca Gatti, a newborn baby, suffered severe brain damage, which is lifelong and irreversible. Those brutally frank words were how the Louisiana Medical Review Board explained to Ryan and Susan Gatti the parents of their new baby girl, Rebecca, why Rebecca had suffered irreversible brain damage due to the incompetence of Dr. Irwin and now will require round-the-clock care for the rest of her life with no chance whatsoever for improvement. Well, on the day that I gave birth to the boys, um, I was very scared. You know, it's first time you're getting all ready to your life to change. in the delivery room. They would monitor me and they had all this equipment on me and um, and then all of a sudden um, when he pushed down on my stomach when the placenta blew away from the uterus I let out this really loud scream and it was very painful and then I just I just looked at my sister and I knew something was really wrong. I first realized something was wrong with Hunter. Um, well, he was in uh, the NICU for a week, eight days. And um, when he got released, they had told me that um, Hunter was going to have learning disabilities and he might be dyslexic, um, but they never mentioned that he may have cerebral palsy. If I had a chance to talk to the doctor today or directly to him, I would say, how dare you? How dare you take away the life that I was supposed to have? And how dare you do this to Joshua? What I miss most about my mom are the holidays. The house was transformed. My biggest challenge with my mom gone is trying to step in her footsteps. Doctors who are not qualified to perform certain, certain procedures, their, their license should be revoked. Dr. Jacobowitz, I don't have words. I don't have the words to express what your actions has done, the pain and the suffering that he has caused that can never be reversed. These are just a few of the real medical malpractice victims who have dealt with our legal system victimized by bad doctors. This is why we all need to protect a legal system that is designed to protect us. 
and not one that protects incompetent and negligent doctors, nurses, hospitals, and their insurance companies over the common everyday American. Victor Ferrugia of the Ferrugia Law Firm is our featured lawyer and has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike. As one of the best trial lawyers in New Orleans and across the nation, he has seen many innocent and hardworking people injured and killed by negligent and incompetent doctors, hospitals, and nurses. Victor's passion is problem solving. He approaches each case as a scientist trying to solve a problem. He has seen many patients suffer needless injury, and because of that, he is driven to help people who have been harmed by incompetent and negligent doctors. Victor's goal is to get justice and fairness for injured people, safeguard victims' rights, and to help guide the hands of justice. As he has so often stated, medical malpractice is also becoming a deserted wasteland for trial lawyers due to expense, caps, manipulation of the system, judicial influence, and the insurance industry's orders to its insured physicians not to participate or cooperate. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from New Orleans. It is my great pleasure to introduce Victor Ferrugia to the show. Welcome to the show, Victor. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Today we're here discussing medical malpractice in Louisiana. And as we've talked many, many times, medical malpractice cases are handled and looked at differently throughout the United States, depending on the laws that are in that particular state. And you've handled cases of medical malpractice here. Define for our audience what does it mean when we talk about a doctor, hospital, nurse, uh, healthcare uh, official who commits medical malpractice? What's that mean? Well, in, in legal terms, it means that the medical entity, either the doctor, the hospital, nurse, has breached the standard of care in this community for medical uh, services to the public. So let's use a couple of examples, okay? What would be, and let's be kind of an exaggerated so people understand this better, but what's an example of breach the standard level of care? Oh, well, breach the standard, I mean, the obvious one, uh, you, leave some, you leave something in when you sew someone Sponge, up. scissors, you, yes, something like you that. you leave something in okay. the body, obviously. Or a doctor cuts off the wrong leg, right? Correct. And these things happen. I mean, we can smile about it, but people suffer. Yes. As a result of that. Well, and because of medical malpractice uh, uh, cases, uh, doctors are much more careful. I mean, before they uh, operate, they they mark with, uh, the left and the right. Yes. And they're, they're very careful now. Yeah. But mistakes still happen. What should a person do? You know, this is what we see a lot of when... You know, you have a loved one who dies in the hospital or a loved one who they went into the hospital, let's say it was supposed to be a standard, easy type of operation, but then all of a sudden a doctor comes out and says, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but your father, your mother, your daughter, whatever died, or they are now paralyzed. We tried our best, it didn't go right. What should a person do? Because we can't automatically believe what the guys or the women in the white coats are saying is true, right? That's correct. We and everybody should do their own independent investigation. So where does it start? What does a person do and what kind of problems and hurdles does a lay person run into to try and really find out what happened in that operating room? Well, it's it's very difficult to get the records. Uh, first, I think, and you that's need, intentional, right? Yes, and you by need, the by the hospital. Yes, so oh. you you need to find a, an attorney. Yeah, you help. absolutely have to you have, have an to attorney. have an attorney because, because the attorney has to what? They have to uh, evaluate the case first. Yeah, see what they think, uh, and then they can 
get the records. Yeah. They can uh, start a suit, and uh, then there's there's a before you actually start a lawsuit, there's a medical review panel. Which so, is you have to submit information to the Louisiana Medical Review Board, correct? That's correct. And they are going to do what? And they are going to come up with a three doctor panel. Yeah. And that panel will hear the case. Yes. You as an attorney submit the summary of the case as you see it. The three doctor panel will evaluate the case and decide whether they believe there's a breach of the standard of the care of what that doctor did okay. do. So let me ask you this. Um, normally with a lawsuit, you know, I'm from California. Yes. They don't submit um, cases to a medical review board before they file suit, all right? Can a lawyer not submit a case to the Med Louisiana Medical Board and still sue the doctor in the hospital? Yes. They can. Yes. But how does that affect the case? Well, um, you know, they can always bring up the procedure in our state yeah. to review the... Is that before. a legal procedure? Is that a legally required procedure? It's uh, Or just a custom? Well, you can, uh, you have to go to the legal, the, the medical review panel. You, you have, have to go to, to them, required. but you don't have to show up. You don't have to follow through with it, but you have to, there's a requirement yeah. to, to just uh, file it. But some lawyers uh, do not believe that it's, it's equitable that they ever will get a, a verdict for uh, the plaintiff on, right. on those panels yeah, and because would, the doctors protect themselves. Yeah, and I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Uh, I heard a uh, percentage that only one in 300 cases submitted to the Louisiana Medical Review Board comes back positive, meaning a recommendation for the lawyer to say, to file a suit on behalf of his client. Uh, do you have any numbers well, like this? Well, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. I mean, I know it's very one-sided. Yeah. I'm not sure about those specific numbers, okay. but uh, you so, know, I know of, of the cases I've handled, yeah. it's always come back negative. Yeah. I've always taken it. After that, gone to a jury, and they have a different perspective yeah. on it, and, and they have found medical malpractice so, where the review panel says there is none. Yeah, so the jury's here in Louisiana have the experience to properly evaluate the the recommendations or non-recommendations from the Louisiana Medical Board, is that right? Yes, well, uh, the key really, if, if the Medical Review Board yeah. is uh, going to be protective of their doctors and hospitals. Are you allowed to say that in court? Uh, are, you, are you allowed to say, hey, my client's case in front of the Louisiana Medical Board was not recommended as a viable lawsuit, but ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, you understand these are doctors trying to protect doctors. Are you allowed I, to say that? In, in closing argument, it's not evidence. Yeah. It's obviously not evidence that they can, can consider yeah. uh, in their verdict, but in closing argument, you can make that argument to the jury. Um, the key in these cases yeah. is to find an expert witness that agrees that there was a breach of standard of care. Yeah. And so you're already, you're starting out with three doctors against you. If you go to the medical review panel, right. let them review it, then, and they go against you, it could be two to one or it could mm -hmm. be three, zero against you. So they already have some experts on their side saying there's no breach of care. You have to find an expert that is credible, right. that, uh, uh, that agrees that there was a breach of standard of care. Okay. And that's the tricky part of a medical malpractice okay. case is get your expert. Oftentimes in these tragic situations, like you're handling a case for your daughter right now, yes. where her husband died as a result of medical malpractice. Um, in these cases, when doctors come to the loved ones who are in the waiting rooms, waiting after surgery and say they're wearing white coats, they're nice people, they're saying, we have some bad news for you. We tried our best, but your brother, your husband, your daughter, your wife, died on the operating table. We tried our best. A lot of people believe that, don't they? Yes, of okay. course they do. Yes. I don't want to appear to be a negative person because let's face it, if there weren't cases of medical malpractice, you know, we wouldn't even be talking about this, would we? That's right. And doctors, despite the fact that they have all good intentions, many of them, 90% of them, sometimes there are cases where 
you know, they are incompetent or negligent. They forget things. They leave sponges in a person's body. They, you know, uh, cut off the wrong leg. And these things actually happen, right? Yes. So from a loved one's point of view, somebody who's lost somebody or somebody who has a, uh, a loved one who's now paralyzed, you know, to their life's totally altered right now. What, how, what could I, as that person, if I wanted to do an independent investigation and get my dad's, my mom's, my wife's, my daughter's medical records, how could I go about that without hiring a lawyer, or do I need a lawyer to do this? Well, uh, you can actually get your own medical records. You mean my records? Yes. You not my get, wife's records. Exactly. Not my husband. I mean right, my Right. You can get your wife's. own medical records, but um, in order uh, to get some, your loved ones. Yeah, if, your if, relatives. Your relatives, then you'd have to get an attorney. You to, have to, to get start, an attorney. To start the case. Which the attorney will subpoena the records. Yes. That's Do right. the hospitals turn the records over right away? Oh, well, it takes a while. It takes a while, uh, like what, yeah. six months? No, no, not 30 days maybe. Okay, 45. now you've, had, you've seen cases where the hospitals don't turn over all the records, right? Well, sometimes. And, and sometimes. you've seen cases, we all remember the mo movie with Paul Newman in The Verdict, where the hospitals altered the records, right. lied to protect themselves, right. right? Which brings me up to um, this issue you know, you're a lawyer. There's a lot of people who think that lawyers just file frivolous lawsuits to um, get jackpot justice. You know, the frivolous meaning they have no no absolute credibility whatsoever, um, and it drives up the prices of health insurance. What's your opinion? Not health insurance, but it drives up the malpractice premiums for doctors and hospitals and that sort of thing. What's your opinion of what I just said? Well, I think it's mostly false. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, uh, most credible doctors, uh, lawyers, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, will evaluate the case. And if it's if it's a frivolous yeah. case, they won't take it. They, Let's say they're, you they're, they're safeguards in the justice system. Yeah. Because if it is a frivolous case, it'll never get to the Not jury. Worth any it'll, merit. It'll, it'll never get to the jury because the judge has judge the option throw it out. Throw it out on summary judgment. Okay. Yes. So when you hear the insurance companies say that we have these caps, caps meaning maximum amounts of money to protect doctors so people don't go crazy and drive doctors out of business. Uh, because there's a lot of frivolous lawsuits filed by greedy trial lawyers. That's not true, That's is it? not true, no. It's not true. That's true. Because the court system throws them out, right? They never see the light of day. They never and I just like to say, you know this, if a lawyer continues to file frivolous, worthless lawsuits, they're going to lose their license, aren't they? They will. Because they're they wasting will. the court's time. That's they're making correct. a mockery of the court system, right? That's correct. So let's talk about you brought up a lawyer will evaluate a case. What is the criteria you use to determine whether you want to take on a medical malpractice case? Well, first, uh, yeah, I get the, the facts from the, from the client and... Yeah. Uh, to the best of their knowledge. Yes. Because they're still in the dark. Well, they're still in the dark, yeah. uh, but they will have, uh, they'll have some idea of something went wrong. Yeah. And they'll, they'll give me their theory of what they believe went wrong. Yeah. I will check it out. I will uh, uh, ask some expert doctors that I know yeah. uh, what they believe, whether or not there was a uh, breach of the standard of care. Yeah. And uh, I'll get back to my uh, potential client and say, yes, this is worth going forward. And uh, especially if there are serious injuries. Uh, the example with my daughter lost her husband, who was yeah. only 31 years of age, right. who uh, you know went in to get checked out for chest pains and um, and the uh, you know even the medical records say he came in for chest pains and then in in this doctor summary says denies chest pain, so you know he denies the, he, supposedly yeah, right he okay. came in that was but the he reason came he came in there in. of his he, own volition because of chest pains and then in the doctor summary says denies chest pains so the doctor wasn't paying attention and you know he could have easily done an EKG, fifteen minutes yeah. max is all it takes. Just set up the machine and get it done. Yeah. And they would have determined that so he they sent him home without checking his heart. Yeah. So and this is a misdiagnosis, isn't misdiagnosis. it? Misdiagnosis. And and from what I've read, and you know, I've done a lot of these type of cases, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty-nine or sixty percent of all medical malpractice mistakes. 
are related to a misdiagnosis of a, a, a condition yes. so that the condition worsened Worsen. and the patient died or got worse, correct? Correct. correct. Have you found that to be the case in your practice? Too? Yes, General. yes. And that. let me say this, you know, 99% of all the doctors are great doctors. They mean well, right. but they are human beings. They are. They do make mistakes. Right. They need to be held accountable. Right, and if they take it on too many cases and if it's a clinic situation where they're seeing many patients. Yeah. So uh, let's talk the, about how doctors, hospitals, and healthcare professionals and the insurance industry are related. How are they in the same boat? Because they have a lot to do with the legislation that is, has been passed in your state since 1975, limiting the amount of money that a loved one, a victim, a family can recover in cases of medical malpractice. How are the healthcare professionals and the insurance industry related? Well, they, you know, they, they've combined to lobby the legislature yeah. to get the caps. Yeah. So now in Louisiana, we have the $500,000 cap. Cap for, on? On the medical malpractice case. Yeah, on non-economic and economic damages. Correct. Which are the only two damages in medical malpractice cases, right? That's correct. Yeah. Right? So let's talk about non-economic and... Uh, economic damages, which in this state is limited to $500,000. And I'm going to give you an example. And you can, for our audience, define uh, like non-economic damages encompasses pain and suffering. Okay, let's give an example. I handled a case where a 38-year-old healthy single mom went into the hospital for elective neck surgery and two days later was classified as a quadriplegic. Why? Because the anesthesiologist was not paying attention to what he was doing and the blood supply got cut off to her brain. And now for the rest of her life, 38 years old, eight year old daughter, cannot work anymore. She was a postal worker. She was making $40,000 a year. And she probably would have worked another 25, 30 years, okay, to retirement. Right. That's, that's classified as economic damages, right? right? But the pain and suffering, and I just want to dwell on this a minute. As we sit here, as we sit here, yeah. If I'm responsible for one child, eight years old, and I no longer can work, I no longer can take care of myself, I'm in depression, right? Correct. I can't drive a car, I can't do anything. I can't move my legs, I can't move my arms, anything. What is, how is that monetized, that pain and suffering? In Louisiana, it's limited to $500,000. Now, if I'm gonna live 30 more years, 30 into 500,000 goes what? Goes about 20, less than 20,000 a year, right? It's a woefully small sum. It cannot, it doesn't come close. So to, the, the to, reason we're doing this show yes. is because almost in every single case where you try a medical malpractice case, I am amazed that the jury does not know this cap exists. Is That's that correct? Right. That's right, they don't know the cap. So they in, may award, as they did in this woman's case, a $5 million verdict, only to have the judge say, you know, I'm sorry, folks. The law in this, in this uh, state limits, I have to drop that down to 500,000. I gotta cut it in half. And then the jurors, right. the jurors look at each other and say, that's not fair. Right. Well, the reason we do these shows is we wanna educate people to say, change the damn law. Exactly. Right? That's what we need. That's what we need. Because in I mean, this example of this one case where she could have worked another 30 years, and in 30 years, even at $40,000 a year, that's $1.2 million. She can't get that. Right. She has to get her economic damages. She has to, the pain, loss of mobility yeah. is, is the most devastating yeah. thing for a human being. Yeah. They can't go anywhere. Yeah, let me ask you this. How do we, what is, you know, like in California, we had on the ballot last year, we have a $250,000 cap on pain and suffering. Okay, unlimited economic damages, right? And on the ballot last year, and this was passed in 1975, same as your, there was a, an issue that if the Californians thought that 250,000 wasn't enough, they could increase it with the standard of living cost to $1.25 million. They, it was defeated, two to one. And it was defeated because the insurance companies rolled out the same advertising which says, you know, this is sponsored by those goddamn greedy trial lawyers piling frivolous lawsuits in seek of jackpot justice, to right. seek jackpot justice. And that's been the case for the last several decades. Tour reform 
yeah. is has really affected but juries. Why? Juries, yeah. You and they I believe all that. Yeah, you and I understand that. this. Yeah. You and I understand this. Right. Why isn't it getting through to the average Louisiana? Well, because uh, you why know we, we don't we don't have the budget to to advertise it. Uh, we don't have the lobbyists. Yeah. They've spent millions and millions of dollars to uh, to get tort reform legislation, uh, right. national, uh, statewide, and uh, you know it's just the uh, the deep pockets uh, have. But we have to educate the jury. Yeah. When, when we go uh, to the jury, we. Yeah. Uh, we, we just have to uh, educate the public that, that these cases are necessary and we have to compensate the victims yeah. for what they've lost. Right. Now, okay. even though we have laws, we're not giving them what they're due. What does a viewer who may unfortunately be in a situation of being, you know, a victim of medical malpractice, what should they do? I suggest they seek an attorney yes. to help them out. Get all this information and present the case. Right. To evaluate okay. the case and then pursue it and 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 get justice for them. Yeah. And if they have been damaged and if the doctor has done something illegal or yeah. the hospital, yeah. if it's illegal or malpractice, you right. know, if it's negligence, then uh, they should be compensated yeah. for the errors or the mistakes that were made. Okay, one, I have one other final question, which is this. Yes, there is a cap on the amount of money that you can recover for economic and non-economic damages, as we've discussed in this show. But take this example of the person who's now a quadriplegic. They're going to need medical care for the next 30 or 40 years. Cost a lot of money. Where does that money come from? The state's going to probably have to pay that. So the so state of Louisiana pays it. Right. And how do they pay it? Or exactly? it could be also federal uh, Social Security so disability. It, it so it would be the federal and the from state the government. taxpayers' money anyway. Correct. Is that right? That's correct. That's where they get that money. That's, so should it come from there or yeah. the insurance company and the doctors? Right. So the insurance companies have basically said, we don't want to pay, even though it's our doctor's fault. Right. We're going to have the taxpayers pay. And the taxpayers don't realize that, do they? Okay. Let's talk they about one last, one last, this is the third last question. Okay? <laughs> Let's talk about the standard of care. Okay. Let's talk about that. If I'm dependent on the state of Louisiana or the federal government to give me the kind of care that I need because I'm a quadriplegic, um, am I going to get good care? Do I have a choice in the doctors I can go to? No, I, I don't think you're going to get the, the, the kind of care yeah. that you would if you could select the doctor that you wanted. If yeah. you had enough money to go to the doctor that you need, yes. uh, you would get better care than uh, the doctors that you're going to get uh, right. on, on the state or uh, federal disability. All rules. right. I want to thank you for spending time. It's been a real pleasure seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.